Well, hello there. Live from Kingbridge Conference Center and Institute in King City, Ontario, I'm Susan Radojevic, and this is Corner Office. In our final episode, before we take a summer break, we conclude our series on complexity with part two of how to build more effective customer relationships. According to American Express Global Customer Service Barometer, an American report, 55% of Americans say they walked away from purchases because of poor customer service. A whopping 93% say the companies fail to exceed service expectations. Based on these statistics, it's fair to say that customer dissatisfaction is widespread and as a result, customer relationships with brands are strained. Because of the plethora of communication channels available to customers today, their dissatisfaction is increasingly dangerous for brand sustainability. And the relationship brands have with their customers is increasingly more important. Joining me to share how leaders can bridge the customer relationship gap are our corner office explorers, Deborah Pickfield, principal of ThinkSpot, and Jean Le Tourneau, CEO of SBVCG Inc. And our special guest is Herman Tang, Chief of Sales and Treasury Officer of ING Direct. Nice to have you all in corner office. Hi. Great to be here. Before we get started, a few rules of engagement. After all, Corner Office is a hybrid intersection where conversations take place before, during, and after the show. And today, we are streaming live from Cambridge Conference Center and Institute. So, if you are watching us online and have a question, please use the chat tab found on your screen. If you are following us on our Twitter hashtag, CoLive, post your question using the hashtag. Maria, our community explorer, is monitoring our channels and will make sure we get your questions. Okay, with our engagement channels open, let's get started. Fifteen years ago, ING Direct embarked on a journey to create a different kind of customer relationship. A relationship that focuses on helping make banking simpler and also more relevant for its customers. How do we answer leaders who are saying, I would love to build more effective customer relationships, but it will make my business more complex and I can't take the risk and money to go forward with that. Does building relationships make a business more complex, more risky, and more costly to manage? That's the big question. And I'm going to start with Herman. All right. Well, it's an interesting question. And I would have to say that uh, I'm totally disagreeing with that statement because for me, it all turns around the customer experience and making the customer feel better and, and buying more products of you and referring more of their friends. So at the end of the day, it's not mutually exclusive to be customer relationship focused and, and, and investing in that while still making sure that the complexities are reduced and costs are contained. It's just a matter of discipline and choosing what to go after that you know makes the biggest impact in your customer experience. Anybody else want to add something to that? Well, does that mean then you have to be more narrowly focused on what, what you're trying to do, do you, or do you try and serve a, a wide range of clients? Yeah, I think it's two things, two things. So one, yes, you need to know your target group, who you're going after, and, and making sure that the needs of those clients are met. And two, it means that you have to make very tough choices sometimes and say, that's not something I'm going to offer. I'm not, you know, able to offer you that. I always use with my, uh, my staff the example of, uh, of Starbucks. If you go in and you sit at Starbucks and you you know, take a seat at a table and you expect to be served at your table, you're in the wrong place. Same <laughs> with ING Direct. If you expect to go to a branch and have all the face-to-face -face contact of a normal bank, 
that's not how we operate. We, 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 make, we use the digital channels and, and that's where uh, our customers live and breathe with their banking. You know, I, I want to pick up on what you just said about you have to be selective in who you choose as a customer. Have we in the past been more focused on <coughs> um, being everything to everyone as a business? Is that what we've done? We've, we've really wanted, you know, business has been great, so we yeah, decided... I think uh, in the past a dollar was a dollar, so whether it was coming from a, a customer that you not necessarily would have been looking to go and run after, but you would welcome the one dollar <coughs> and now it's becoming like you have to be more uh, targeted more focused on relationships that you want to build and you want to create a more one-on-one uh, -on -one experience which means that yes on if you're going from a mentality where you have been pushing products over time and now you have to start to understand your customers that's that's a, that might look like complexity but in fact, it's not complexity. It makes your business a lot simpler when you define groups the peop of people that you want to work with using your customers to give you that input. Okay, let's just use a really good, an example that I heard this week, which really kind of made me go, I have no, this is complex. So let's presume you're Best Buy. Somebody goes in there to buy something. They're constantly on their phone figuring out what the best prices are that they can get somewhere else. They're getting other people to tell them what they felt on your product and then they'll go buy it from Amazon or somewhere like I don't understand how you know that's that's a radical shift and there's no loyalty there because they're just doing it based on price and what their peer group are telling them quickly like this is something they're taking yeah. a long time you know to, to piggyback on I mean you're in a very very traditional marketplace the financial mm -hmm. institutions mm -hmm. you know being an ex-banker myself so you said earlier that you focus on a particular client, a customer, and, yeah. you, and you decide to say no to others. Yeah. So you must have a lot of, company, a lot of cu customers coming from other institutions. Mm -hmm. So what makes them come to you and, and like Amazon, what made this person go to Amazon? Is it price? Is, it, is that the, 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 the hook? Sometimes it is, and there is a group of customers that really come for price. But a lot of customers that come for experience. In a commoditized world where a lot of products and services are the same, you can only differentiate mm -hmm. from the experience that you create, the emotional connection that you can make. And if you are able to make that connection consistently, you're on a winning path. So that's the, that's the key to success, but it requires a lot of discipline and uh, choices and, and clients we say no to. I say, okay, you want that specific service and that hand-holding? We can't offer it, and, and sorry, that's, uh, that's just how we do business. And we fire clients, so that's what, that's what happens sometimes. Fire clients, I, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I agree with you. I mean, there are certain customers that you don't want to have as a business. But in general, mm -hmm. um, you've, t you've taken a bold step. I mean, ING Direct has taken a very bold step in that. But are other companies out there prepared to do that? Are they prepared to do that? And then if they're not prepared, then why aren't they taking other steps? But if we think back to last, our last show and, you, and your example, it's almost like we're going to have to re-educate consumers that if the loyalty isn't going to be there any longer, which I get that, the technology's there, it doesn't have to be, you can go and get your, your purchases anywhere, then you're going to sacrifice something on the other side as well. Because serve everything, whether you're a bank, whether you're, I don't care what your industry is, you can't serve everybody all the time. So, and that last month was exactly what frustrated you. And excuse me, CIBC, I still haven't <laughs> I heard didn't back say from you. Bank. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying that. to be diplomatic there. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm going to have a question for you. Yeah. you know, when you talk about customer experience, customer experience is almost becoming a commodity as well because everyone is talking about yeah. customer experience. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you differentiate on the customer experience when you know, all the banks are talking about customer yeah. experience, when Starbucks is talking about customer experience, when everyone is? So how, yeah. how, what's the magic there? You're asking for the secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I, tells I, I know my boss is, is it orange? <laughs> is it orange? <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's certainly orange. <laughs> There's two things that I, I think we focus on uh, very, very uh, religiously. And that's one, the hiring. So we don't hire bankers. We 
hire people that can service and that understand what we're trying to do here. So we hire a nurse who knows mm -hmm. how to care for people. So that's one. And then two is the oh. why. So Did you what, know that was her favorite book? All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> I didn't know that. But, but it's the why. So yeah. why are you here? What are you trying to do? Oh, you're trying to make money. Well, yes, that's an outcome. But really, why are you here? So we, at, we tried to answer that question. And mm -hmm. for us, it's helping Canadians live better lives. And that means that in everything we do, that's the primary goal. Of course, our shareholders need to have a decent return. Our employees need to be fed, mm -hmm. so they need a salary. But really, the why is what drives us. And if, they, if the core of your, your customer service employees and the core of your organization knows the why, why you're here, they're going to live it and breed it and give that extra discretionary effort that a lot of people that work don't give. So can I ask you a question? So I get that now in, in 2012, but mm -hmm. way back when you came up with this, 15 or whoever, I mean, wherever it, gen, the genesis was. Arkady Kuhlman is our uh, I mean, that founder. was fairly radical thinking back in whenever, yes. uh, 1997. Yes. Um, was there a lot of uh, resistance from within the firm or did everybody kind of go, yeah, we get it, you, you really are? We had a luxury to start from scratch and right. uh, they, he handpicked the, uh, the team and started building it and, and ingrained it in the culture. We start with a one-week program, of which one day we dedicate to the community as a volunteering, a one-week program to paint you orange, and there's r rigorous uh, you know, comebacks to, to keep reinforcing that. And yes, it costs money, but we believe it's worth it. And we're not perfect, I'm not saying that, because we also have our, our things we need to improve on, but really it's about you know, understanding that you hire the right people, instill the right culture, and then trying to create something special. It's, it's about trust, though, too, right? Yeah. I, what I'm hearing you say, Herman, is that it's trust. So how do you, how do you generate trust? To, you, you have to generate trust in order to gain insight. Yeah. So how did you do that? How do you yeah. generate trust to gain insight? By being human and not <laughs> hiding in corner offices, it's the show today, but oh, we, I am sitting, I have you know, a lot of associates uh, in, in my group and I'm sitting right on the floor and I'm in their lounge and that's where I have my lunch and basically making the connections and they know, oh, you're so busy, never see you and uh, you're always in the meetings, but when I'm there at six o'clock, seven o'clock and they come up and ask questions and help me with, uh, I help them with client uh, issues. That's where you build trust, and uh, you're just being humble and, and a good leader. That's, mm -hmm. that's all it takes. So <clears throat> hiring a nurse in banking is yes. pretty unusual. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, as uh, in my work, if you did not have 15 years of, uh, mm -hmm. or 35 years of banking experience, it's pretty hard because you're not in the club. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the club, you don't know how our business is working. So yeah. Does it make your business more complex? Because if you have to train, you know, nurses, uh, uh, hotel uh, yeah. concierge to go and work with you, I mean, don't you have to spend more money then? And it makes your business uh, when you guys go out and try to cut on prices. Yeah. Does it make you vulnerable? No. Well, it, it's a very good point. And actually, it, it forces us to be very disciplined in the number of products that we offer mm -hmm. and the services, how we offer them in order to be able to you know, still compete out there. Because if I have a whole range of products and five different checking accounts to, to choose from, and I have to train all my staff on that, that's going to be very costly. So we have one, one product that we think is, is best for Canadians. That's what we uh, invest in and train them exceptionally well in. So yeah, it's it's also the trade-offs that okay. you make in that yeah, sense. It's taking you, you're taking a, a very bold step and a very courageous step, but you also know exactly what it is that you want to be down the yeah. down the road. So that that's that's very key. Yeah. Um, we need to take a break. See already how quickly, <laughs> how quickly time goes. So okay. we're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. And when we return, Deborah, Jean, and Herman are going to suggest a few experiments for us to do. Don't go away. The 
future of meetings and events as a business builder and leadership intervention tool is not about going just to talk. It's actually going to do something. Dealing with corner office, one thing that where I thought was found huge value in this was the preparatory work. Getting people to, uh, to trust and uh, I call it going deeper with them because if, unless you can get them to go deep, you don't get out what they're really thinking and you don't get out the really good ideas and you don't get out the, the, the whole purpose for, for having the collaboration. Having the, the live people here and the online and, and having the both, both brought in, I really like that as opposed to just having online or just having live. And uh, they actually walked us through a whole process and asked us some tough questions. If you're going to be put in front of a camera and they ask you, you know, why do you exist, I thought that was just a stroke of brilliance. An, an idea for them to take away, like some of this, take some of this brilliant conversation and this is how you might consider beginning to apply it slowly into mm -hmm. what you do in your daily life in one small thing to get them to start shifting. This arrangement was very conducive. We are back, this is Corner Office, and we are live from Kingbridge Conference Centre and Institute in King City, Ontario. I'm Susan Radojevic in conversation with Deborah Pickfield, Jean Le Tourneau, and our special guest, Herman Tang. We are wrapping up our show for the summer with our final installment in our complexity series, Customer Re Relationships Part 2. This is the experiment part of the show, and it's how how it's going to work is that Jean, Deborah, and Herman are going to have two minutes each to explain their experiment, something you can do to help you get closer to your customers. If you have questions, use our social media channels to post them. Okay, but I think we do have a question from our virtual audience, so before we get started, is that correct, Maria? Okay. Okay, so the question that we got from our social media channel, um, I think it would be best if Ermin um, answered it, and it is, how much time should CEOs spend with customers? How much time? Right. Do they spend a lot of time uh, now? <laughs> I would say up to 10, 20%, and uh, I can say that, that Peter Cito, our CEO, yeah. he spends quite a bit of time also in the social channel with his own uh, Twitter feed where he responds to clients, even on a Saturday afternoon, it's pretty amazing, and uh, has his blogs and, you know, why Jack's in the contact center, goes to our cafes where we have face-to-face -face contact. So in that sense, I think it adds up to, to 10, 20%. You know, he's the only CEO that I've found as active on Twitter. Yeah, it's amazing. He, he is amazing. He yeah. does interact quite a bit. And, and your Twitter channel is very active with customers. Yeah. You have customers telling people to go be a customer of yours. Yeah. 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 So it's, 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 it is very engaging. So 10 to 20 percent. Well, yeah, that, that would be the ideal, <laughs> I think, because I know they are super busy and yeah. their agendas always pile, out, pile up. But, uh, you know, really knowing what, what's in the customer's mind is, is very important. At the end of the day, they pay the bills. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's make sure they're heard. Okay. But, does he, but does he look at everybody as a customer, or he or she? Do they look at everybody as a customer, whether yes. it's employees or stakeholders, shareholders? Or, yeah. 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 So that's yeah. half the battle, right? That's good. Keeping yeah. your ear to everybody. Yeah. OK, our experiments. You ready to share your experiments? So two minutes. Who wants to start? Go ahead. Good I know. Work. I'm always the one who starts. <laughs> Jean, you start. You start. You start. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's a simple experiment. Uh, next time that you have a project to do is you have two options. Uh, first option is uh, to put a team together to figure out, you know, what should be done, going through the process of uh, taking time to select the people on the team, <coughs> get the people to work together, do a lot of work, or you have the option to go and talk to your customers and then 
reduce complexity by going and talking directly to your customers. So the, the experiment would be next time you have a project, you should try two avenues, one of which would be you know, to do the regular way where you put a team and see how long it takes, how many decisions and what's the lead time does it take and the next uh, step would be to try to find if you would go directly to customers, how long would that take and what would be the outcome of the feedback that you would get for your customers and in, in your solution and you will end up probably taking 10% of the time. So are, are you saying that a group uh, get together to figure out what the plan is and then a group goes out and just talks to customers and then they come back together? Is that what you're saying? I mean, sometimes when you're in management, you have a, a question, you have an, an issue and what you are doing is you put a meeting together and then you delegate a task to a team to go and can you find me a solution? <coughs> and that takes a, a lot of time and a lot of energy for a lot of people and a lot of discussions. And you as a management uh, or manager, you know, you could go the regular way, but you should check out that also, you know, like Herman was saying, you know, spending a little bit of time with your customers, go and talk to them and see how quick it would be to go from step A to step B, where you would go and, and find on your own by talking to your customers, you know, what should I do? Yeah. So it's just to compare what would be the outcome of team A working on an issue and you as a person just go and talk to your customers and see what would be the outcome. So it's telling, so it's really asking the customers what they want instead of telling them what we think they want. <laughs> Is that what we're saying? I mean, it's having yeah. a team figuring out uh, yeah. and making assumptions and predictions and using uh, big data to figure out what the customers want and uh, just simply going and talking to your customers. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of time wasted in organizations for people trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what are my wants. customers looking <laughs> yeah. for. And I know I've been here and I feel I've been here 20 years and we will have something good for them. Yeah. And many people don't even talk to their customers. Mm -hmm. That's true, that's true. Herman? Yeah, I'm happy to go. A um, little bit to, uh, to Jean's point, uh, staying close to the customer. And, you know, it's always a thorny issue that, uh, that really tests your organization. So if there is a complaint, the complaint needs to be handled. And in many organizations, ours is as well, we have a special team that goes out and tries to help the client to resolve the issue. The experiment I propose is to have your leadership team, so say your 20 most senior leaders in your organization, each takes, takes turns to resolve one issue every month. So every 20 months it's your turn, maybe you can uh, up the frequency of it working really well, <laughs> but at least your senior management team is also involved in resolving the issue and you know, basically looking at what happened here, what uh, can we do to resolve it and what can we learn to make sure it doesn't happen mm -hmm. again. And if your senior le leadership team, even the legal guy or the guy that does the risk management is involved in those kind of things, I think it's going to help your uh, organization and it's going to help your uh, client experience. So is the leader leading the team or, is, or are they just no, doing, they're just, they're just resolving it themselves? So, so they're picking up the phone and saying, what's the, what's the issue? Is that yeah, I mean, they would have a little file and say, okay, here's the issue, here's the resolution we propose. And that's the email that leader gets. Okay. And he says, okay, I'm gonna call Deborah, talk to her, tell her that I'm a leader in, in risk management, never deal with customers, but I'm, mm -hmm. I wanna resolve mm -hmm. it. Wow. And uh, basically say, how can we, uh, can we help you? And what is it that we can learn? Because that, that way, the, the leader needs to take the ownership. You can't just say, uh, now you're gonna do it for me. No, the leader needs to call the customer. And I do it, and it's sometimes very difficult yes. to have one customer that still SMSs me, text messages me <laughs> oh, really? a year, two years after what happened, so, yeah. May, may I ask a question? Because my experience was, if you're not in sales, you don't talk to customers. So if your risk management uh, VP or your CFO starts to yeah. customers, don't yeah. you have some people somewhere losing hair in your organization? No. <laughs> because usually, you know, you don't even call customers to collect money from them unless it's a service call. Yeah. You know? yeah, no, but it, it, is, it is a little awkward and it, it gives a little bit of tension. Yeah. It really tests the culture, it really tests the endurance mm -hmm. of, of your management team. Mm -hmm. 
that the customer issues need to be resolved and they need to see it. So next time when they talk to a front line, they, they know what it is to sometimes uh, you know, have, to, have to resolve mm -hmm. these issues. Wow. Yeah. Deborah, do you have something to add or do you want to do your experiment? No, I'm just thinking, I, no, I, I love the suggestion. I think it's great we just, when we get so distant from it, we can't relate to it any longer and I don't care what organization you're in, whether it's political, religious or um, business, you can't get too far removed from your client. Yeah. So what I'm hearing everybody say here very quickly, Deborah, before you do your experiment, is that we seem to have really withdrawn from the customer. Our customer, you know, who, who is it, Peter Drucker, that says the only reason a company exists is to have customers, right? Is it, yeah. Wasn't he the one that said that? Mm -hmm. But we seem to have forgotten that, and yet now we're kind of going back to square one. Is, is, that, is that what I'm hearing? There was more uh, people were pushing products, and there was, you know, the power was in the hands of the corporations. Now with the social media, mm -hmm. is someone is not being happy, it goes out and it goes out pretty quickly. Yeah. So the power is shifting because if you're unhappy like you were last time we were at the show, you know, that goes out and that goes out big time. You know, and that's spreading much quicker than it used to be. Yeah. So the power is shifting. And, and, and one last point I want to make on this. At the end of the day, the client experience is a team sport. Making sure that the client experience works is a team sport. So even the CFO has a role to play as a team member. I've ever referred to customer experience of being a team sport. It that's, is. That's a good comment. Operations, marketing, yeah, yeah, product yeah. management, yeah. sales, service. That's they need to yeah. work together. Yeah. Even the risk manager, because if the policies Absolutely. are crazy, the customer is going to be really upset. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Deborah? Yeah. Oh, my... Uh, Your experiment. Okay. So I'm going on a different angle. I want to follow up on what we talked about earlier, when I mentioned that Best Buy example. So the consumer is shopping in your store, you get the bricks and mortar, and then they go buy somewhere else. Um, so supposedly what's happening now is organizations caught in that bind are putting the pressure down on their suppliers and saying, fine, if I've got to compete at an Amazon level, you're going to be able to help me do it. So they're going, because that's what their customer is telling them by shopping somewhere else. Whether in our case, whether they're shopping across the border, or whether they're shopping online. So um, what was fascinating is that in the Rotman issue, uh, the spring issue that just came out, they were talking the exact same example that happened to Walmart. And it's a great article. I would really recommend you read it in that Walmart was caught being, I think about seven or eight years ago, saying that you are one of the highest environmental abusers um, with your products and, and the companies that make your products. and. So they had the environmental activists on one hand, and yet they wanted to be able to say our business as usual is to make sure that we get the lowest price for our consumers. So what they ended up doing, and it's I can't articulate it as well as the article does, but they ended up saying that same attitude that Best Buy is taking, which is let's go down to our suppliers and say you help us solve this problem of the business as usual. You end up making the products in a way that are more environmentally conscious for to make our customers happy and so they engage them in the whole process so it's not necessarily using the clients it's actually using your suppliers or your customers primarily your suppliers in helping you solve the problem so in a complex world that's what Best Buy is doing which are there um, to their suppliers saying we can't compete at Am with Amazon you've got to help us Walmart did it and that's where I think we have to start thinking about how do we work collaboratively I know you love that word um, <laughs> we're collaboratively with a lot of different people to figure out what the customers how to meet what the customers doing because okay. they're going somewhere else on their price point. But there's a fine line bef between working collaboratively and maybe it's because it's Walmart that you mentioned um, and passing, and and passing the buck. article I was telling you and about. passing the buck. So if you're, you know, if, if the environmental issue, the example that you gave, well, could it have been, you know? No, actually what they did is they said, okay, Tide, for example, I remember reading this a year or okay. so ago, you make your containers that much bigger, use concentrated soap, we have less shelf space to do with boxes of Tide, and it's, and, and then at the end of the day, they can get more wash loads out of less space on their shelf. And that was so it meant they were more environmentally conscious, but they worked with their suppliers to do it. Because the customers, maybe they weren't even knowing they were demanding it or wanting it, but they, they considered the environmental activists to be a key stakeholder anyways. And so they wanted to meet them as the customer where they were. Yeah. IKEA was no different. That article I was talking about yeah. where they wanted to lower their prices all the 
time. I mean, they just worked with all their suppliers to find out better ways of doing something. So that is maybe my approach. I was thinking, well, how can we, if we don't even know the client's going somewhere, they're just buying somewhere else, then let's figure out a way to work together with everybody that's part of the whole system. Can, can I ask you a question? Because mm -hmm. if uh, Best Buy goes to Sony and says, I need 100 bucks off because my clients are otherwise going to Amazon, Sony says, hey, but I'm selling to Amazon, so... Yeah, it's a good question. Suck it up. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's the choice that the customer makes and the value that they perceive. If then the value is in the price that they pay, instead of the experience going to Best Buy and seeing the product and feeling it, then, uh, then that's, that's where the water, the water always runs to the lowest point. So they're going to have to adjust and say, okay, I'm going to compete with Amazon because I also have an online channel yeah. and the mm -hmm. client can just pick it up in the store and just compare the price yeah. in order and then add some value in the store when they pick it up and they buy some other products which Amazon can't do. Right, exactly. It's a really good and so but that's that complexity that they're dealing with is that loyalty is gone from the consumer yeah. perspective. Because everything is now instantaneous. We can find out anything about a product we want. Um, the example somebody was telling me his son was buying it was Peter, his son was buying a couch, they were in the brick texting their friends, finding out from yeah. the influencers out there in social media and knew what they were, whether they were going to buy it or not. Yeah. That's a whole new world. That's yes. complex. Yeah. Sean, did you have anything to add before we wrap up? I mean, technically, the more you uh, improve customer experience, the better you make it. Uh, technically, people are willing to pay a premium for that. So why are giving they? me... Are yes. they really? <coughs> I yeah, would I mean, pay. You are, would, but I, would. I don't know that the generation of people in their there 20s and 30s... There are surveys that say that between uh, people are willing to pay, you know, 20, 25% yeah. more... Who? What, what age, though? I mean, I am not going to go mm -hmm. into the, the study. I, I, I will, I I will share it with you, so, uh, <laughs> Suzanne, you can put it on the website. But there's a point where, you know, uh, uh, price break and great customer experience is like, you know... Uh, going to McDonald's and get a roast beef, it's like... But that's you and I. I'm yeah. not convinced every generation is feeling the same well, way. I, I, think, I think that um, there are quite a few people that feel that way. And uh, I know that I would pay for I pay for service anytime because I, I don't like to be... Uh, I like to be treated properly and I'm, yeah. I'm okay because, you know, it's that do unto others as you want to do unto you. But I'm not you. sure everybody feels that way anymore. Well. So. <laughs> okay, we, we're, we're going to take this offline, I think. That's why you have to focus on the client <laughs> that you want to exactly. exactly. That's exactly the right, yeah, you can't serve everybody. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> we can't serve everybody. So Susan, you know where to go now. <laughs> but I want to serve everybody. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Herman Tang, for being in Corner Office today and a special acknowledgement and a thank you to Deborah Pickfield and Jean Letourneau. It's been a real, real pleasure <laughs> working with you on this series. Corner Office, How to Build More Effective Customer Relationships, Part 2 is locked in and our complexity series is a wrap. This episode will be available for viewing next week on our website. If you missed an episode in, in the series or if you can watch all four episodes on our webpage, Corner Office Episodes. Our website is theperegrineagency.ca. If you have thoughts on today's show, go to our website and click on the agency blog and post your comments. Find us on Twitter, our hashtag CEO Live, or follow me at Susan Radojevic. Bookmark our agency blog and be the first to hear about our fall series on how women are affecting business and the bottom line. Our 21st Century Women Leader Series is coming in September. If your organization has a business method, tool, or technology our community should know about, or if you would like us to have, if you would like us to broadcast from your location, go to our website and click on Contact Us. Thank you, Maria, and a big shout out to our sponsors and partners coming up on your screen. Check them out. And last and certainly not least, thank you for participating. For Corner Office, I'm Susan Radojevic. See you back here in September. Logging out. <laughs>